So thank you very much, Julian, for this very nice introduction. Thank you very much to all of you for being here today. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about label free proteomics and, and a new project uh, that I've been doing during the last year with uh, Mike Snyder's group at Stanford. Uh, and what we have been doing is personalized homics profiling of uh, yeast. So with that, uh, let's see. Okay, this has some important works. Okay, I will do like this. <laughs> so the main topics of the talk is going to be first MS1 quantitative proteomics. Then I'm going to talk a little bit why yeast is an interesting organism to study personalized homics profiling. And I will wrap up with uh, some proteomics uh, that we have done within the encyclopedia of DNA elements that is also known as a code project. So one of the main challenges that every proteomic researcher has to face when they are doing a quantitative experiment is that the dilemma of either being very sensitive, very comprehensive, or being scalable. And scalable means the number of samples that they are going to be able to process. So there are several techniques that you can do to move around that ecosystem. And one of them has their advantages and uh, at the same time, some disadvantages or challenges. So here you have, uh, let's see, the pointer works, label-free uh, proteomics, which basically you run uh, your peptides or your samples after digestion, and uh, you pretty much you record all the intensities, whether it is in the MS2 uh, scan or in the MS1 scan. Then you have another set of techniques where what you are doing is you are labeling the peptides, so you can either compare within the same sample, different with this, within the same rank, different samples. So for that you have metabolic labeling, SILAC, or isotopic tags like OET labeling, and also TMT. So in this case, the major advantage is that you get a rate of bias in the LCMS uh, analysis, but this, for example, SILAC and isotopic tags are not very scalable because you have to bear the samples. And you lose, you lose a little bit of sensitivity and comprehensive of, of protein coverage. In the other hand, uh, with TMT, for example, you get a lot of samples per run, around 10 samples per run. You get a very comprehensive uh, view of the proteome, but you lose a little bit of sensitivity. And then you can go with more targeted approaches where you use spike uh, heavy peptides, where you can get very, very sensitivity, but you only get few targets, but at the same time, you can run very fast analysis, and you can run many, many runs per day. Within this, I think one of the, the major advantages when you start a proteomics project is label free, because it's very, it's very easy. You can compare several conditions. It's very highly comprehensive and sensitive, and you don't need extra sample preparation. The protocol pretty much starts when you acquire the raw samples, then you have analysis of the MS1 uh, scans. What you are going to do is extract features within the retention time space and the M over C space across the different samples, and then you are going to create a master uh, feature map of the whole samples of the whole data set. In the other hand, you are going to take all the MS2 uh, scans. You are going to do data researching. You are going to create a database, and what you are going to do is go and translate these peptides with these coordinates of M uh, retention time and mass to the master feature uh, table that you have. And at the end, what you get is the number of peptides with different intensities within the different runs. So at Thermophysics Scientific, we provide an extremely comprehensive workflow for label free proteomics. We have some preparation within our peers' colleagues, where we have cell culture media, sample preparation kits, proteases, uh, fractionation kits, especially the high pH fractionation kit in spin columns, and the standards. And the standards that they are going to allow us to quality control uh, and monitor our samples. We have the QSAT family, QHF, and QA plus, and the tribute family, which is the fusion and the fusion locals. And with all these four instrumentations, uh, instruments, we can do uh, very high quality LCMS uh, level free analysis. And of course, the new um, the new product that we are uh, introducing is PD with the label-free feature, uh, features. So we have a study design, 
where we include data management and we, we can, uh, we can uh, include also the factors within the study, so sick versus healthy or the different, different strengths, strength A, B, C to N. Then we can do data research using different uh, search algorithms like Bionic, MS Amanda, CBHST. And finally, we can do quantitation. So we can do TMT, we can do level three, and we can do, do even we can do other quantitations uh, using different chemistries. So one of the key things that we are, uh, that is, I've been focusing my protocols when I do level three, is quality control. And quality control is important because when you do level three, you need highly reproducible runs. So for this, one of the things that I'm using is the PRTC, or the Pertor Retention Time Calibration Mixture. What allows me to, when I spike it in every sample, I can use them to make sure that I get the right retention time. So when I do the alignment within runs, I get a proper identification. The other thing that allows me is to do extremely good quality control. So if I do a VCA plot of the intensities and retention times coordinates of each of these 15 peptides, I can assign whether the data set is good borderline or bad. The other thing, I can use it for recalibrating uh, the variance of the different proteins that I identify in my sample according uh, to the concentration of the PRTCs that I spike it. And of course, uh, the key for being successful in this, uh, in this workflow is the ACNLC 100 which is a very small compact LC that allows for high pressure up to 1200 bar. And we introduced it last year in the, at Hugo. And uh, what we are introducing this year, so a 70 centimeter EC spray column that uh, allows you very high peak capacity, very reproducible uh, retention time, and even more identifications. And it's a 75 centimeter column, 75 centimeter uh, micron ID, and it fits just right in your machine like this. It's a plug and play. And I think there is nothing in the market that uh, allows for such a career. So with that, uh, we think the protein is covered to point to platform. What we have introduced is an advanced feature detector that allows us to identify more features within the different um, uh, runs. We have an attention time alignment that is going to allow you, we will have set our deviations within the different runs is going to allow us to align and get a composite uh, master uh, database, a feature mapper that is going to map the identifications to those features, and of course we have a statistic package that uh, allows us to do t-tests, ANOVA, normalization scans, and different products, uh, different runs. So this is uh, the current uh, workflows that we have at, at PD. So it's uh, dra uh, drag and drop uh, plugins that you can start for the spectrum files, and then we have the Manora feature detector. So this, uh, this node, what it's going to do is discover all the features within the, the run, and then in the other branch, what we do is all the data research. And then we have the consensus feature, the consensus workflow, where we have the plugins for the retention time alignment, feature mapper that maps the patent identifications and patent and products to the features, and then finally we have the patent and product quantifier that provides intensities for the identified patents and products. Here is a, a view or a screenshot of the software. So what you could see is that you get different tabs, uh, for example, in the peptide groups, you get the, all the peptide IDs with the different parameters and where are the samples where this feature has been detected and identified. And of course, if you click, you can see how well the alignment it has been done. So one of the things that we did, uh, or I did, uh, at the beginning of the year when we were working with the uh, 75 centimeter columns and this developing like PD 2.2, is trying to see access of performance and benchmark uh, this uh, workflow. So what we did is we took HILA adjust a standard one microgram and we analyze it using label free in a QXACTIF HF using the label free nodes uh, from video. So, as you could see, uh, we got excellent, we were comparing 75 centimeter columns and 50 centimeter columns, and you could see that we get extremely great reproducibility, and this is a normalized uh, intensities. We also got five orders of magnitude, 
we were able to identify with the 75 centimeter calls over 38, almost 38,000 peptides per run. But because we are doing now much across uh, data sets, at the end we were able to identify within five runs over 40,000 peptides. Um, the average correlation, the Pearson correlation was 96%, so extremely reproducible. Uh, so I think that the, this, the, this workflow actually with this platform works extremely well. Uh, we saw that we identified around 4,000 proteins uh, in common when we combine both type of columns, but with a 75 centimeter, we got a little bit more, 5% more. So people usually complain about data dependent acquisition and have a lot of missing values. Well, so my answer to that is that it's not true. So we get less than 5% missing values with the runs. We get around 45,000 uh, features that we can use and quantify and identify. And uh, as you can see is that pretty much 80% of the features that we quantify, we can identify with peptides. So saying that, I decided to compare and benchmark to one of the racing stars in the label free arena, the data independent acquisition method. And what I did, uh, I created a database with the DDA uh, products that I identified from my DDA runs. And then I used a spectrum to do the quantification and, and discovery of those products. So as you could see, uh, we identified with DDA almost 20% more products and peptides. And when we look at the coefficient of variation, there is pretty much no difference. If there is a slightly difference, it goes towards the DA. And with that, I'm going to change gears. So because the next thing that I did is I applied this workflow with uh, Barbara Dan. She's a senior research scientist from uh, Mike Snyder Lab. And uh, although we didn't work together before, we met over doing fermentations and a home brewer. So she's a yeast expert, and uh, we decided to start a collaboration. So we talked with Mike, and then we decided to do personalized, uh, introduce proteomics into the personalized omics profile of different yeast strains. So, and the question that everybody asks is, what makes us unique? And um, so here is last week, last Wednesday, actually. Uh, through my colleagues in the genetic division at Thermo, I had the opportunity to get my genome sequence. And this is partially of my genome for privacy reasons, I'm not showing to you completely. <laughs> but uh, uh, I mean, you can see that I'm pretty unique. So there is no African American in this universe that has a genome you know, close to mine, but neither a Caucasian and Hispanic. So I'm, most, I'm closer, slightly closer to a Native American. But you can see from my accent that I'm not. <laughs> but uh, the question is not what makes us unique. I mean, the question is that how we translate in the final of that. I mean, these two guys, they have a very similar genome. But obviously, the final of that is quite different. So the idea for us is that how we can assess variation across individuals. I mean, we have, how can we link the genotype to the final of that? I mean, when we start with the DNA sequence, and then we start the process is start to process a protein and that is going to yield the phenotype. I mean, we have the chromatin that is going to open, the RNA, the transcription of factors that they are going to bind, and then we're going to have to, uh, RNA that will make protein. How is all this working around? So, and the motivation is two sides. So if everybody talks about personalized medicine, and, um, and of course, the idea is to understand how can we stratify patients using omics technologies that we can tell them what is the therapy that, or we can target the therapy that they have, uh, we have to give them to have a positive effect. And we think that yeast is a perfect uh, model because many of the basic functions of yeast are correlated with, uh, with humans. So what we did is uh, we took five strains, so two laboratory strains, one clinical strength that uh, it was uh, obtained from the lack of a patient with AIDS, and then two one strengths. And what we did is that an array of form technologies. So we did DNA full DNA sequencing, we'll look at the transcription, of, uh, uh, transcription factor of binding, 
uh, ribosomal profiling, and of course we did also proteomics. And this is what I chip in. The rest was done by Mike Snyder's team. So the proteomics workflow, pretty similar to what we did before. So we did the cell cultures for these five strands and triplicates with centrifuge, took the pellets, and then with the sample preparation using the Pierce sample preparation kit for mammalian cells, but we changed uh, the license buffer because of course this is not going to break down like that. So we took uh, just come uh, protocol where we put uh, urea, 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 and the big meter. And then we use an LCMS platform like basic uh, QE Plus with the NFC 1200, and we use PD to do the data processing. So the first thing that we wanted to ask is that what is the improvement that full genome sequencing is going to bring into proteomics? So what we see is that when we compare the SNPs of all the, all the strains compared to the reference genome from the S288C strain, then what we saw is that, of course, the laboratory strains don't have many different SNPs compared to that reference uh, genome, but the, the one strains and the clinical strain, they have lots of them. And then if you see the difference, I mean like, there are only 70 SNPs that correlate or overlap within the five strands. So the idea was like, would, the, would proteomics provide any fundamental uh, knowledge of what are these SNPs doing? And the response was no. I mean, we actually, we did the searches with the custom proteomes and the reference proteomes, and we got 99% of them. So we were not able to find new proteins, and we were not able to find new SNPs. So, but we found slightly new proteins, new identifications when we were doing a, when we were using the custom proteins. And what I think what happened is, was like because the database is smaller, the search space is uh, smaller, and we have a little bit more of a relaxed FDR or more IDs at a, at a given FDR. So that was disappointing, but uh, and I think one of the reasons is that first we so the OD was 0 0.7, so it was very early in the log phase. So there is very little variability within the strains. Uh, also, we don't expect all the products to be expressed, and of course we did like one hour runs. So we also don't expect to have a high coverage coverage. So it was very difficult for us to see. Uh, great coverage of the, all the products that we have. But um, what we are thinking about is in the next, uh, in the next uh, experiments, do a time course of the, of the whole cell cycle and go on with a massive cell capture experiments. So, but then we do like some QC checks. So as you could see, the correlation within the strengths is super high. It's around 90%. We have some outliers, so like you could see that the the R uh, strain for one is a little bit different to the others. I did also like a robust uh, Malanovis distance um, a test, and the idea was to, if I could be if I could identify randomly obliged within the sample, and, and we found though, I, I found three. So, but this go this work uh, from the two B samples, so which is this one. But uh, I actually didn't remove them because I don't think that is going to matter for the further analysis. So, but we could say when we do a PCA analysis, we are able to separate completely the five strands. And what you could see is that the ones that are closer, the laboratory strands, they cluster very, uh, very good together. The one strand is cluster also very good, and the clinical strand is it's here like it's completely different to the others. So, <clears throat> and then we started to integrate genomics. And one of the things that we did is that looking at the at the average Euclidean distance within the principal component to see how much difference are those strains uh, for the different omics. And what we could see is that when we go from transcription down to golden expression, that distance is starting to be less and less different. So what tells us is that the cells actually, they are not different, in the, not such a dis uh, the differences in the phenotype are not as such as different as what we see in the genome. And I think that that makes sense because, I mean, the, the, the cell is not going to spend energy on things that they are not functional. And, um, we then did uh, an ANOVA, and then we identified around 10% of the proteins to differential express. 
I did uh, use a technique called figures of merit that this technique was developed by Atul Bude when he was young, back in 2001. And the idea is that when you, you look at, uh, you have an algorithm, this algorithm, what it does is that it looks how many uh, clusters do you have to do or, or perform when you do a k-means uh, clustering to get the maximum information. So in this case, and then what you look is that how much uh, decrease the mean within the different clusters, the number of clusters. So pretty much what it says you is that if you start doing k-mean clusters for more than 10, 10 clusters in k-means, you are not going to get extra information. So if you look at the differential express product, what you could see is that pretty much what we saw in the PCA uh, plot is that the laboratory strengths they are always very similar. Then the one strength, they, have, they are somehow similar. And the clinical strength is completely different. So what we expect with genomics? So what we see is that we have functional consequences of variable regions when we do the transcription factor on VB. So for example, if we look at the sub one, uh, you can see that it's highly it's, it's very deep but uh, in different intensity or with different strength, but the RNA levels don't change. If we look at uh, this other transcription factor, what we see is that we have different bindings, and of course it somehow correlates with the uh, RNA. So the next thing what we did is like try to correlate the proteomics data with the transcription. And we see if we compare all the genes, we get absolutely no correlation. But if we take all the differential expressed products, then we see correlation, which I think is kind of interesting. So the next thing what we did is that, okay, moving from RNA to protein, we we'll look at uh, differential expressed proteins. We look at, uh, for example, this transcription factor, and we saw that it's different, completely different in uh, the A strand. And then we took the, the proteins, when we did clustering, the proteins that they are lower in A compared to the other uh, strands. And what we see is that the protosomal ubiquitin independent catabolic process was highlighted when we did a, a network analysis. And what we saw is also that uh, this gene from ubiquitin, it was involved in the whole path. So it actually, we were able to correlate uh, RNA with protein at this level. But <clears throat> what about global happiness? So I told before that we wanted to do a whole time course uh, to actually see what is the role of the SNPs in the in the different strengths. So what I did is, let's do wine. So I talked to my friend Tom at Gallo Winery, and I told him that we have this super cool project with Stanford, and we decided to do sugar wine. So he, he's, the head of, uh, he's the head of the research uh, uh, team at, uh, at Gallo, so we took sugar juice, and um, they did like, you know, how did they do it? So very industrialized methods, uh, and then they were talking like different uh, time points within the day, and we did like five replicates, and one of the things that he noticed is that uh, the strain A was clumpier. So that means that it clumped, uh, the cells clump together and then precipitate. And that's when you are in, a, in, a, in the fermentation business, that is something that you are looking for those strains, because it's easier to filter. When you do beer, you do wine, it's, uh, you can take that, uh, you can take the, the liquid pretty easily and separate it from it. So we went back and looked at the difference between A and R. And what we saw is that there was some difference. We did the cluster analysis, and we see that there was uh, the spindle pool body separation, which is related with clamping. And then we we'll look at the open chromatin. And with open chromatin, what we see that HCR1, it's, uh, it's very, in, for this gene, it's very open is not so open for the R. And uh, what we saw is that this gene actually regulates the expression of flow 11 gene, which is involved in populations of the clamping process. So from this, the further work that we are planning to do is that whole cell and proteome for these samples. We are doing metabolomics. Uh, so at Thermo, we have a huge uh, array of uh, metabolomic technologies that we can use from, C, uh, from ICMS, uh, GCMS, and we can use our key exactly for also for doing small molecules very well. Uh, we are going to do RNA-seq to see if there is correlation. 
and of course we will enjoy the thing. <laughs> so we also got the one maker to give us the testing notes for the different samples. Uh, I don't, I didn't get the slightly rubbery thing, but uh, <laughs> for me it is good. And with this, the summary is uh, that I can say from this work is that and this one level three dynamics is a great compromise between sensitivity, power, uh, protein coverage, and throughput. All the building blocks to be successful in quantitative level three dynamics are currently available within our thermal official portfolio. Uh, we did over 700 plus uh, sequencing experiments, and I hope uh, in the next uh, few months we will be able to gather all this information to see if we can do uh, personalized on this profiling. Uh, and I think that the other thing is that even you can do a lot of uh, profiling, you need a deep understanding of the underlying biology to be successful in this process. And of course, uh, have fun with you in this. So I would like to thank Barbara Dan and Rahif. These guys are the ones who have done most of the experiments. Mike Snyder for being very supportive with this collaboration. Uh, my team, Dave Horn from the PD team, the PD team in Bremen, uh, Debbie. Uh, my cubicle mate, Roman, who is always helping with the LC, my boss that allows me to do this process, and the guys, uh, my friend Tom, here from Galapagos. So, thank you very much. Thank you.